morning, Johnson Ferry, and I want to add my happy Father's Day to all you dads, those of you here in the room, and certainly those of you dads uh, watching from around our city, maybe even around our, our nation and even world. And I don't know if I have the power to do this, but today, dads, on your day, I bestow upon you all the guilt-free TV watching you want. So you, you do you today, dads, and, uh, and know, that we, know that we love you. Today we are continuing in this series that we have called Rebuilding that will take us most of the summer to accomplish, and we're looking at the book of Nehemiah. If you have your Bible with you, I want to encourage you now to take it, and we're going to read in just a second uh, Nehemiah chapter 2 there in your Old Testament. And Austin did an incredible job last week setting up where this story is headed this week. And we want to read... And stand as we read in honor of God, Nehemiah chapter 2. Let's stand together, those of you in our two rooms here on campus, those of you at, uh, at our home campus there in your den, you stand as well. Nehemiah chapter 2. And even though our goal today is to make it through all of chapter 2, let me read the first six verses. And it came about in the month of Nisan... In the twentieth year of King Artaxerxes, that wine was before him, and I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had not been sad in his presence. So the king said to me, Why is your face sad, though you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of heart. Then I was very much afraid. I said to the king, Let the king live forever. Why would my face not be sad when the city, the, the place of my father's tombs, lies desolate and its gates have been consumed by fire? Then the king said to me, what would you request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. I said to the king, if, if it pleased the king and if your servant has found favor before you, send me to Judah to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. Then the king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, how long will your journey be and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me and I gave him a definite time. Father, as we look into your word, would you help your word by your spirit to help us to love you, to worship you, and to reach and disciple people for Jesus through you. We'll pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Today we are going to see a Nehemiah as a leader. I asked you a few weeks ago about a burden that perhaps you're praying through, a burden that you feel is from the Lord. Of course, directed by his spirit, captured in his word. But what, what is a burden of God that you have on your heart? We're seeing in this story Nehemiah's burden and learning lessons from it. Today we're going to learn lessons from Nehemiah as a leader and how God works through a leader. How God is looking for a leader that he can use. And, and leadership is something I've tried to be a student of. Leadership can be encouraging. It can be rewarding. It can be frustrating. It can be challenging. Someone last week actually mentioned to me about me being in my first year here at Johnson Ferry and how that was going. And I said, well, I think, you know, Bryant retired after 38 years. But the way 2020 is going, I'm, I'm going to retire next year, I think. is uh, um. Now, but leadership is, is challenging. And I've tried to study leadership, whether it's the leadership of, of basketball coaches, high school principals, military generals, CEOs, pastors. And we see here Nehemiah today, in particular, as a leader, as we will see throughout the whole book of Nehemiah. So the question might need to be asked, what is a leader? What is a leader? There are several definitions of a leader or leadership that range from saying a leader is a person of influence, a leader is someone who can turn vision into reality, a leader is someone who has followers. My, my personal favorite definition of leadership or what a leader is, is one that I read in Webster's Dictionary. It says, leader, a one who leads. 
which is more profound than you think because leadership is not just an attitude. It's not just a thought of the heart, but there, you have to do something with it. You actually have to lead to be a leader. And there are principles of leadership that are taught today. There are books written about it, podcasts that are put out there, conferences that are held. And, and there is a lot that we can learn as Christians when it comes to leadership generally. But since most of us, not all, but most of you watching this today, most of you in our, on our campus today, most of you are followers of Jesus, we might want to ask a more nuanced question. Not just what is a leader, but what is a Christian leader? What does it look like to lead in the kingdom of God? To see leadership, we certainly look at all of Scripture, but there's no better leader than our leader, Jesus Christ. If you're not a follower of Jesus today, we always ask people to consider where they stand with the Lord. Are your sins forgiven? Is eternity granted to you? Is Jesus, now here's a phrase, is he the Lord of your life? That's an antiquated word, Lord. We don't use that in everyday conversation. But it's a way of saying, is Jesus the boss? Is he calling the shots? Is he in charge of your life or are you still in charge of your life? So you can't be a Christian and you still be in charge. Jesus wants to be in charge. And we see in, in the Bible that Jesus teaches us a lot about leadership in very different ways than are taught in the world at large. Think of all the examples. Jesus, the night before he is... He is uh, betrayed, and the night before, he's taken to the, the cross to die for our sins. He, 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 in this act of leadership, wraps a towel around his arm, and he bends down, and he washes the stinky, nasty feet of his disciples. And he says, this is an example. In fact, Jesus one time asked his disciples, do you want to be great? I wonder if there's anyone here today who... You say, I, I want to be great. I want to do something great. He says, all right, you want to be great? Become the servant of all. Jesus talked about humility. Jesus modeled leadership where he was lonely at times, or at least alone at times. Jesus modeled that, that great leaders in the kingdom of God often go through periods of suffering and enduring that suffering. You don't hear that in the world at large, and yet if we're going to be Christian leaders in the kingdom of God, we need to model our lives after Jesus and what all Scripture tells us. So there are principles that we need to learn about leading in the kingdom of God. If you have a burden on your heart, and maybe God's been working in your, in your life to have a burden for him, it's going to require leadership, self-leadership, at times organizational leadership. And that's what we're going to see today, a powerful principle that all leaders in the kingdom of God need to know, need to embrace, need to establish. But before we announce what that is, let's do a little recap of the story. You may be new with us today or maybe the first time back in a while with us today. We're looking at the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah is a man who the Bible says is a cupbearer to the king. That's a very trusted position, almost like a bodyguard, because the king, who in this instance is King Artaxerxes, is the most powerful person on the planet. So this is a big job that Nehemiah has. Nehemiah was a Jew, though we have no record that he ever had even been to Israel or to Judah. And yet, at one point, some of his brothers, or at least kinsmen, fellow Jews, came to Nehemiah and Nehemiah asked him a simple question. Hey, tell me, tell me about the homeland. Tell me about Jerusalem, that great city. I know it's been rebuilt. I know the people have to be flourishing. That's God's plan. Tell me about it. And they said, Nehemiah, the people are in distress in Judah, in Jerusalem. And the, the walls, the gates, they're not established. And and it broke Nehemiah's heart, not simply because he thought it would be a wonderful idea for walls to be built. But he knew the whole redemptive story of God, how God wanted to establish his people, how God wanted to bring his people out of exile back into the place that he had promised to them. And that, and that broke his heart and it formed a burden on him. And what we see in chapter 2 is this transformation from an internal burden to actions that led to progress. Nehemiah is a leader. And yet, if we are not careful... We study a passage like the one today, and we come away with 
practical lessons of leadership, and we might miss the central character of the story, who is not Nehemiah, by the way, but it is God. And one of the wonderful themes that will work its way through today's passage is how we see the hand of God, the good hand of God on Nehemiah. Because time after time in this passage, you will see that none of it would have happened. None of it even makes sense apart from God's mighty hand. Did you know that God's hand is on your life if you're a believer? Maybe today you need to be reminded of the goodness of God and the goodness of his hand. So here's our principle today. It's a simple one, and yet if, if we're going to accomplish what God wants to in our lives, we need to realize this for us, and here it is. Here's the Christian principle of leadership. It's this. Where God guides, he provides. Where God guides, we're talking about God guiding us, where God guides, he provides. Provides. I wonder if you just, as a favor to me, would we just say that together in both rooms there in your den? Just say it loud and proud. What's the principle today? Where God guides, He provides. Yeah, one more time. Where God, He And we're going to see in Nehemiah's life today that God is providing throughout him. It's almost like a father. Imagine on Father's Day you think about teaching your child to ride a bicycle and the training wheels come off and and they they start going. You're running with them and you're providing supporting time. They fall. And I get this picture of our heavenly father. As he's he's pushing us along and we're learning to pedal and he's saying, I got you, I got you, I got you. And God is guiding And he's providing. We'll see five gifts that God provides to a leader. God provides to Nehemiah. And they all start with the letter P. Why? Because I like alliteration. So, number one, the first gift that God gives to a leader and to Nehemiah in particular is the gift of his presence. It's the gift of his presence. We read out loud verses 1 through 6, but there's a detail in there that if you're not careful, you might miss. Verse 1 says that, and it came about in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, that the following story happens. Now, that may not mean anything to you, but if you go back in chapter 1 where we began two weeks ago, you saw that the events where, where Nehemiah was serving King Artaxerxes and these men came to give him that awful report, it happened in the month of Kislev. In the calendar, Kislev is about four months prior to Nisan. So the the picture we get in this story is that Nehemiah hears of a problem, that Nehemiah starts to think, and we saw the text says that he sits down, he weeps, he mourns, he fasts, he prays. And then in chapter 2, this is the scene where Nehemiah begins to reveal that to the king and to the world. What's the picture? The picture is that before Nehemiah did anything, for four months, he fasted and he prayed, seeking the presence of God. I I wonder how often we are so quick to, to rush out and just do something, accomplish something, impulsive decisions, without really seeking the presence of God. God wants his children, he wants his leaders in the kingdom to be driven not out of selfish ambition, but a godly ambition whereby his presence and his power and his might are on the leader. I I love in verse 4, when the king asked him about why his face was so sad and why he was going to reveal this, I love that's that quick little phrase, verse 4, so I prayed to the God of heaven. We get the sense from Nehemiah that he's a man of prayer, that he's a man whose number one agenda is to please his heavenly Father. Is that your goal in life? 2020 has been a crazy year. I don't have to explain that to you. But if there's going to be any gift from this year, it will hopefully be that it has taught us to depend more on the power and the presence of God. And if we don't walk away with that lesson, then we might have missed the whole point. Nehemiah prayed to the Lord. He sought the presence of God, and God worked in his life. In the New Testament, we read in Ephesians 5.18, it says, Don't be drunk with wine. That's dissipation. 
Simple command, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's what Ephesians 5.18 says. I wonder if that's true for all of us. Now, I, know, I know you say, well, yes, you know, when you become a believer, you're indwelt with the Holy Spirit. So I, I'm made right with God. I'm given the righteousness of God that comes through the indwelling Holy Spirit of me. And, and that's true technically, but I just wonder practically, day by day, are you being filled with the Spirit of God? That doesn't mean that you lose the spirit overnight and you have to get it back the next day. But the idea is like a sail with wind pushing the sail and the sailboat therein. This pressure that's driving you to say the sail of my life is filled up with the presence of God and his spirit. Is that true of you? I love D.L. Moody, the old evangelist, eighth American in in the 1800s, American evangelist. He had this quote. It's such a good quote. He would say this a lot. And it goes like this. He talked about his passion, his burden for the Lord. He said, the world has yet to see what God can do with a man, or a woman, of course, with a man who is fully and wholly consecrated to him. By the Holy Spirit in me, I will be that man. I wonder if that's true for us. Do, do, we, do we get up every morning and say, God, I cannot do anything of ultimate value without your presence in my life, without your power in my life. And if, if God is guiding you, if he's blowing the wind into the sails of your life, then his presence is with you. And it's a gift. Because where God guides, he provides. Now you got it. So that's the first one. He provides his presence. Number two, what else does God provide as he guides? Well, the second thing is that he provides plans. Plans. God, at times, will reveal to you specific things you need to do. And we get in in the story here in verse 7, 8, the idea that Nehemiah had a definitive plan as to what he was seeking to do, verse 7 and 8. So the king asked, what what do you want? And I said to the king, if it please the king, let letters be given me for the governors of the provinces beyond the river that they may allow me to pass through until I come to Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the forest, which is by the temple for the wall of the city and for the house to which I will go. And the king granted them to me because, I love this, because the good hand of my God was on me. There it is again. Yes, Nehemiah is a leader. Yes, Nehemiah is doing things that are admirable. But none of this story makes sense unless the good hand of God is on his life. And I love just the the practical nature of Nehemiah as a leader here as God provides these plans for him. The plans that he has are not only practical, but they are courageous. You might think, well, how, how, does, how does asking for wood, lumber, timber, how, how is that courageous? Well, it's because we don't understand the history of the story. Nehemiah is courageous. If you, if you know the story, Ezra and Nehemiah go together. In fact, in the oldest uh, Hebrew manuscripts, it's just one book. It's not, Nehemiah, it's not Ezra and Nehemiah, it's just one story. And if you go back and read Ezra, you'll see that Ezra, or Zerubbabel, love that name, Zerubbabel sought to build the wall. Nehemiah is not the first one to try to build the wall. In fact, they tried to do it before, and yet some political opponents came in and convinced the king, oh, no, you can't can't let them build the wall because all they want to do is build up their name, and they'll be a rival to you. And and so the king, maybe not knowing all that was going on, he he stopped the work. In fact, this is what Ezra 4.21 says. So now issue a decree to make these men stop the work, that this city may not be rebuilt until a decree is issued by me. So notice what Nehemiah is doing. He's taking this bold step to ask the most powerful man in the world to change what he had said a few years before. This is courageous. It would be like you going to your boss and saying, hey, um, Look, I got this burden on my heart, and, and I, I, I was wondering if I could have two things. And your boss would say, sure, what are, what are the two things? Well, number one, I'm going to need the next year and a half off. And number two, I'm going to need like $2 million. Do you think, you think we could pull that off? 
Well, for many of us, that would just be laughable. That wouldn't happen. For Nehemiah, it could, it could come at the cost of his life. You're asking this man to reverse his decree, to give you all this money, to give you all this time away and you, when you are his trusted bodyguard. And what's amazing is that it happens. As the good hand of God was on Nehemiah's life. It's courageous, but there's also lessons just about it's practical. Nehemiah's not out there just kind of figuring it out. No, he, he's thinking through systematically, logistically, what, what do I need to, what needs to happen here for this to be successful? So he says, King, I'm not just gone until, you know, I, I feel like it's done and then I'll let you know. He actually says, no, I'm going to be gone for a definite time. That's what verse 6 says. Nehemiah, Nehemiah knows to build the walls is going to take some timber, and that was a building, uh, that was a way of building. You actually see that Solomon did the same thing when he built the temple. He put timbers in between the stone to, to make it more, to make it stronger. So Nehemiah needs the wood to build the walls. He asked for that, knows where to get it. And then he knows he's going to need some protection, and so he's going to need letters that when he passes through, they will let him go by the decree of King Artaxerxes. And I love how he's just, he's thought through all these practical things. And if we could just get real practical, if we're going to accomplish something great for God, we, yes, we need courage, but you got to have some good sense, some practicality. I don't know what your burden is. Maybe it's to share Jesus with everyone on your street. Awesome. It's going to take courage. It's going to take just some practical steps. How are you going to do that? Maybe you have a burden to help marriages become healthy. Uh, uh, Wonderful. It's going to take courage, but just some practical steps. Maybe you want to mentor some young people. Awesome. Courage, practical steps. Uh, You know, whatever it is your burden is, you need courage, but practicality. God gives Nehemiah plans, and great leaders do that. Michael Jordan, greatest basketball player of all time, averaged 32 points a game for 15 years. You think about that. He was asked one time, how did you do that? He said, it was pretty simple. I figured out that there's four quarters in a game. I needed eight points per quarter, and that would get me to 32 points. So I just had to figure out some way to get those eight points. And I don't know what that looks like for you, but but you might have this huge God-sized burden, God-sized dream, and that's wonderful, but find a way to break it down into some manageable action steps. God provides for his leader. He provides his, his presence. He provides these plans as his good hand is with him. But you know what else God provides when he's guiding you in life? He provides a price. Now, we don't like talking about this one because sometimes leadership can be very difficult. And there's a price tag to leading. Nehemiah, as the story goes, we see in verse 9 through 15 that he came to the governors of the provinces beyond the river. He gave them the king's letters. Now, the king had sent with me officers of the army and horsemen. In other words, when Nehemiah comes into town, it's, it's kind of a show. I mean, there's lots of people with him, an entourage. And don't think the political leaders didn't notice that when he got to town. Verse 10, when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite heard about it. Now, pause real quick. We're not going to talk about these guys this morning that much, but they are going to appear several times throughout the narrative. And these, along with one other guy by the name of Geshem, are his opponents. And if there was a soundtrack to the book of Nehemiah, I think every time their name was mentioned, you would hear this. And Sanballat and Tobiah, dun, dun, or something like that. These are the villains, or maybe it's Jaws the other way around, dun-dun, I don't know. But you'd hear this soundtrack, because they are the voice of opposition. We'll get to them in a few weeks. But it says that they were, it was displeasing them that someone had come to seek the welfare of the sons of Israel. Verse 11, so I came to Jerusalem, and I was there three days. I rose in the night. So at night, he gets up, moonlit night, I take a few men with me. I didn't tell anyone what my God was putting into my mind to do for Jerusalem. And there was no animal with me except the animal on which I was riding. This could have been a donkey, a horse, we don't know. Verse 13, I went out at night by the valley gate in the direction of the dragon's well and on the refuse gate inspecting the walls of Jerusalem, which were broken down and its gates which were consumed by fire. Then I passed on to the fountain gate in the king's pool And there was no place for my mount to pass. So I went up at night by the ravine and inspected the wall. 
Then I entered the valley gate again and returned. The officials, verse 16, did not know where I had gone or what I had done, nor had I as yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, or the rest who did the work. Nehemiah is figuring it out that this is going to be hard work. And there's a price tag to pay for accomplishing what God wants in your life. Certainly there's opposition from other leaders. We'll see that, Sanballat and the rest. But there's also just difficulty. We get the picture here that Nehemiah goes out at night. He wants to survey what this is going to take. He can't even get to half of the city because he's not even passable with an animal. He walks around. And, and look, the text doesn't say, but I just wonder if Nehemiah looked at the, at the massive nature of this project and I wonder if he just thought to himself, have I made a mistake? I mean, it's one thing back in the palace, you know, you're praying and, you know, the Lord's like, you should do this. And then yeah, I'm thinking about it. Yeah, I'm going to do it. He steps out in faith. And then he gets out there and it's like, oh, my gosh. How, how in the world am I going to accomplish this? Well, you probably know the story unfolds that they will accomplish it. And it's not because Nehemiah is a great leader, though he is. It's because God's hand is upon him. But there's still a price that Nehemiah has to pay. Jesus talked about the price that we need to pay to be his disciple. He paid the price for us to be saved on the cross and through the resurrection. But there's a price we have to pay to follow him. Not earning salvation, but practically speaking, sometimes following Jesus makes your life hard because you're going against culture. You're going against the grain. You're swimming upstream. In fact, this is what Jesus said in Luke chapter 14 about being his disciple. Now, large crowds were going along with him, and he turned and he said to them, in other words, Jesus says, let's have a little private conversation you disciples. You see all these crowds, but I want you to notice something, verse 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother, and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. By the way, Jesus is not saying you should hate your mom, but he's basically saying that I, I need to be priority over even the most cherished relationships in your life. Verse 27, who does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it. There's a price tag to pay. Nehemiah has to pay a price. That's true of leadership, generally speaking. There's a price tag to leadership. I have a former pastor back in South Carolina, Dick Lincoln. He used to always say this, look, if you want to be a leader, you give up your right to a good night's sleep. Can I just tell you in 2020, amen. There's a price tag of, of loneliness at times. There's a price tag of rejection and criticism. There's a price tag of patience. It often takes longer than you want. But are we willing to pay it? And are we willing to trust God? When God guides, he provides. His presence, his plans, a price. And this fourth one is my favorite part of ministry. When God guides you, this is so awesome, that he, he provides his people. His people. This is the moment. Now, we don't know what happened. Somewhere the night ended. Nehemiah gets in front of the people, verse 17, and this is the rally cry. This is the, okay, God, let's put it out there and let's get people to respond, verse 17. Then I said to them, this is to the people he's speaking to, you see the bad situation that we are in. You know, the broken down walls, that Jerusalem is desolate and its gates burn with fire. And here's the ask. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem so that we will no longer be a reproach. Notice, he doesn't say, let's build the wall so we'll be protected. No, no, no. let's build the wall so it lifts high the name of God and how he's rebuilding his people. It's always about the people of God and God's plans and purposes. I told them, how the hand of my God had been favorable to me and also about the king's words which he had spoken to me. Then they said, let us arise and build. So they put their hands to the good work. Do you know how amazing that is? I mean, they've been living there for decades. 
walked by that wall thousands of times, thought to themselves, that's never going to get rebuilt again. All of a sudden, this leader appeals, appears out of nowhere. They don't even know the guy. They know he comes with the, with the you know, affirmation of the king. And then he says, God's doing something. Let's do it. Let's build. And they do. In 52 days. It is unbelievable when in ministry you get to see the people of God rally to the purposes of God. This has been such an interesting, frustrating, overwhelming, and yet rewarding year. And we're so divided as a, not as a church, but as a nation. I mean, everyone's kind of getting in their camps. Coronavirus is a big overblown hoax. We're not taking the coronavirus seriously enough. You got the presidential election and all the stuff that comes with the politics with that. Even this, this latest issue, which is not a new issue, but this, this idea of, of racial unrest, what do you do about that? Well, what we do is we first go to the scriptures, the word of God, which gives us our marching orders, and then we pray by the spirit to do what God's word has, has told us to do. We don't take our marching orders from Twitter or from Instagram or any political party wholesale. We take our orders as the children of God from the word of God. And so we take an issue like reconciliation and we see in the scripture that we have a burden for reconciliation. First of all, between sinful people to be reconciled with the holy God through Jesus And then Jesus wants his reconciled people to find reconciliation with people who in the world's eyes would never come together. And that's what we should do as a church. I met this last week with about 20 of our African-American brothers and sisters who are members, bought in here at Johnson Ferry. And it was raw, it was honest, it was encouraging. And I also left there thinking, we've got some work to do right here at our church. Not to impress the world or to pursue diversity because that seems popular. We don't pursue diversity for diversity's sake. We pursue unity in Christ. And I can't imagine a better picture of heaven and the kingdom of God than if you were to come to John Ferry on a Sunday morning, maybe a year from now or five years from now or 20 years from now, and you looked out and you saw a sea of people who looked different from different experiences and different backgrounds and different races and different socioeconomic levels and different jobs, even different countries, and yet it's It's crazy because while the world is divided, these people are united in the gospel of Jesus together as a family. That's when the people of God have to stand up for the purposes of God, and I hope we will. If God is guiding us, I believe he'll provide for us presents, plans, price tag, people. And we'll wrap it up with a fifth P, prosperity. Prosperity, verse 19 and 20. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite official and Geshem the Arab heard it, dun, dun, there it is again. They mocked us and despised us and said, what is this thing you're doing? Are you rebelling against the king? See, here's the thing. They could not get over the fact that this had to be motivated by politics. This this had to be motivated by government power. That's that's all this is, is some grab for power. They could not see beyond this earth. And Nehemiah verse 20 says, So I answered them and said to them, No, the God of heaven will give us success. Therefore, we, his servants, will arise and build. But you, you have no portion or right or memorial in Jerusalem. These are legal and civic terms. And basically what Nehemiah is saying is that God is doing something bigger than what you can see. And let me remind you today that there's a new king coming. There's a new king coming. You know, we struggle with that too. I think it's because we... Let's just be honest, we get so discipled by the world. You know, we're discipled by Fox News or we're discipled by MSNBC. We're discipled by Twitter or what's popular. And 
and we're not discipled by the Spirit and the Word of God, and we so often forget that God has a prosperity for his people, and it's not that health and wealth junk that people teach, like if you just follow Jesus, everything will be okay, and you get a nicer car and a bigger house. You don't see any of that in Scripture, but you do see Jesus who says, I have something bigger. I have a kingdom that is coming. I have an eternity that awaits. I have a relationship that I want to secure with you. Pilate, the king, he struggled with that. In fact, that that day when Jesus stood before Pilate, and in just a few hours, he would be mocked as a king. Because the people want, they want a political leader. Fix our problems. And Pilate's wondering, how is it that you say you're a king, and yet look at you, you, you look pretty pathetic. And in John 14, he asks him about this, and Jesus said this, my kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. If it were, my followers would fight to keep me from being handed over to the Jewish leaders. But my kingdom is not of this world. You know, this world can be a good place, it can be a difficult place, it can be a frustrating place, but it's a temporary place. It's like Motel 6, we're just passing through on the way to the place that God has for his children, with him forever, and that's only because of Jesus. That prosperity. And God wants to guide us into the purposes, not of an earthly kingdom, but of an eternal kingdom. And he provides us, and he is good, and his hand is good. This story is not just about admiring Nehemiah as a leader. It's about seeing God's hand all over his life. And maybe today you need to be reminded about the good hand of God that wants to work in your life for something bigger than you can ask, see, or imagine. I thought as we wrapped up today that it might be good to reflect on the goodness of God. Perhaps we could just have a moment to worship him because he is good. And he is good, amen? I mean, he's good and his hand is good. If you never received Christ today, make today the day of salvation. Turn to him. Turn away from your old way, the earthly kingdom way, and turn towards the eternal kingdom through Jesus. Most of us, though, are followers of Jesus. And my encouragement to you today is to reflect and to meditate and to take joy in the good hand of God. Because where God guides, he provides. Father in heaven, we come to you this morning and we thank you for the goodness of God. We thank you that your mercy never fails us. We thank you that, Lord, you pursue us and God, you work in bigger ways than we can ask, think, or imagine. God, if there's anyone here today who needs to be reminded of the good hand of God, Lord, would you work in their life, convict them, encourage them, help them to take joy in you. We love you, Father. We thank you. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for new life, and we thank you for your goodness. It's in God's name we pray. Amen.